You are Trump employee number five. You're a central witness in the classified documents investigation. Why are you speaking out publicly with your story now? Well, I mean, it's, it's been almost a year since FBI agents showed up at, the, at my house when my wife was at home. And, you know, over the course of the last year, emotionally, it's been a roller coaster. You know, a couple of weeks ago, it, you know, Judge Cannon says she's going to release the names of the witnesses. You know, you go from highs and lows in this. And instead of just waiting for it to just come out, I think it's better that I get to at least say what happened than it coming out in the news, people calling me like crazy. I'd rather just get it out there. And, you know, the hope is at least I can move on with my life and get over this. I mean, your whole life changed as a result of this. What was it like last summer to read through that superseding indictment and to realize you are Trump employee number five? I mean, I was out with my family out of town on vacation. I got a phone call from my attorney and he said, hey, they just arrested Carlos. And, you know, my heart just dropped. I mean, I'm like, oh, my God. Carlos de Oliveira, who is not only the property manager at Mar-a-Lago, but was my, one of my your best friend. friend. I mean, we used to talk every day, every day. I mean, we were always at least in some sort of contact. And you had just seen him a few days before that. I think four days he was at my house. We played golf. We had a great time. It must have shocked you to. No, it's, you know, it, it hurts. No contact since then. And I should be clear, Jack Smith's investigators sought you out. How many times do you think you've, have you talked to investigators now? I'd say probably uh, between four and five times. Can we talk about what started all of this, which is the boxes? I mean, Trump was clearly obsessed with these boxes. At one point in the indictment, someone refers to them as his beautiful mind paper. <laughs> what was kind of known among the employees about, about why he cared about these boxes so much? Were you guys, did you talk about them? I never talked about them. I really didn't even know what was going on until the investigation I started reading in the news. Employees were getting interviewed, the indictment. So June 3rd, you know, he goes back home. He went back home. You know, we had moved a bunch of stuff, the belongings, everything. That's when he's going from spending his time in Palm Beach to spending his time in Bedminster, New Jersey. That is correct. So, you know, we're there to assist with luggage, anything that needs to go to the plane. So, and since I ran the car service, I had, you know, employees come to help with luggage, and then we were going to bring it to the plane, and then back, up, and then off to New York they went. The other key thing about that is... That was the day that his attorneys were meeting the FBI at Mar-a-Lago. The day before, one of his attorneys had gone and searched the storage room, not knowing that Walt Nada, the body man who is now a co-defendant, had been moving boxes in and out of that room the day before. Did you know about that? No, I, I, I never knew anything about that. The, on, on June 3rd, you know, Walt had came up to me and asked me if he could use one of our Escalades. Since I ran the car service, I pretty much kept control over the vehicles. I had loaded a bunch of the family luggage into a minivan, and I was just going to drive it to the plane, load it up, and that's it. But during the, us getting luggage, Walt asked, hey, I need a minivan. Sure, go ahead. And then he left. And I, was, I didn't think anything of it. It was a little odd the way he asked me. I mean, it, it stood out now after all this. Um, but him and Carlos were gone at that time. And, you know, I didn't know because typically he wouldn't go get a vehicle, drive himself and get luggage. So, so it was unusual for him to make that ask of you that it, day. It seemed odd to me once I figured how everything went, you know, down the line, June, July and August. From what I learned, it, it kind of made sense. So Something you, was up. You weren't just putting luggage on that plane that day. So I just had I only remember Trump family personal luggage. And then what happened is Walt left before me, and he never goes directly to the plane. He's either in the motorcade or when he goes there with the boss, which the former president. And I remember telling him he left the club with, I, I didn't know what he had in his vehicle, but he waited for me at a nearby business, and I told him I would tell him when I was leaving Mar-a-Lago. So I left Mar-a-Lago. I texted him, hey, I'm on my way. He followed me. He pulled out and got behind me. We got to the airport. I ended up loading all the luggage I had, and he had a bunch of boxes. You noticed that he had boxes. Oh, yeah. They were the uh, boxes that were in the indictment, the white banker's boxes. That's what I remember loading. And did you have any idea at the time that 
there was potentially U.S. national security secrets in those boxes? No clue. No, I had no clue. I mean, we were just taking them out of the Escalade, piling them up. I remember they were all stacked on top of each other, and then we're lifting them up to the pilots. How many boxes was it? You know, they asked me in, in the interview, and I, I believe it was I, 10 to 15 is what I remember. I know, they I know being it was, the investigators. Correct. And when you look back on that now, what oh, do you... Well, I had no clue until um, probably the end of June. There was a few different things that happened that kind of opened my eyes to, you know, something's going on here. So you get that unusual request. Did you ever think to yourself, why were there so many boxes at Mar-a-Lago? For me, I'm just thinking, ah, oh, the former president, he has a lot of stuff he likes to lug around with him. I, I, I never would have thought it was anything like what we see Classified now. Classified documents. Yeah, I mean... On that day, as, as you're loading, helping load these, these boxes unwittingly into the plane and handing them to the pilots, Trump is back at Mar-a-Lago. And did you know that his attorneys were there that day? It's, it's funny because I remember seeing this taller guy, I think flicked back silver hair, I think it was Evan, who I now know to be Evan Corcoran. Um, and I saw a bunch of other people in the living room. I had no clue. I'm just seeing all these people. I have no clue what they're there for. I was on the cloister outside over by the bar. The former president was walking towards um, the living room, like he was going to enter the living room. He was with Secret Service. I remember he said hi to me. Hi, Brian. Hi, Mr. Trump or President Trump. And then he went in and talked to them. But I, I had no clue who those people were. And it was Evan Corcoran, Trump's attorney, and members of the FBI, Jay Bratt. Which, you know, I come to realize now, at the same time he's going in there, the boxes are going from somewhere into a vehicle, which are eventually going to the plane, which I load with Walt. Do you ever remember seeing those boxes come back to Mar-a-Lago? I don't. I do not. And then in June, a little bit later, you get a call from Carlos telling you that Walt is coming to Mar-a-Lago. It was actually, we, we live literally 30 seconds from each other. Your neighbors. We're neighbors. So we would always go walk. And just on the walk, I remember him saying, hey, by the way, Walt's coming tomorrow. Oh, cool. That's great. I was like, okay. It wasn't until the following day when we're out walking, he's like, hey, by the way, it's a secret. Don't tell anybody Walt's coming. And well, why? Well, he needs, me to, he needs me to find something out before he gets here. Oh, what's that? He needs me to, you know, how long the camera footage is saved at Mar-a-Lago. And I'm like, well, that's, that's odd. Why, why do you need the camera footage? Why do you need to know how long it's saved? And uh, his response was, I think they're looking for somebody that was there. I said, oh, okay. I wonder who. I, I have, so. so he tells you that Walt's coming, that it's a secret, that no one's supposed to know, and that they're looking to see how long the sur surveillance footage goes back? That's what he needed to find out by the time Walt got there. So now it seems really odd to me. Um, and then not many days later, when I receive a call from the corporate head of security at Trump Organization saying, why didn't you tell me Carlos moved boxes? And, you know, I didn't really know he moved boxes. You know, I never saw him move boxes on June 3rd. I mean, I know now that that's what it looks like was going on. Him and Walt were moving boxes, and then he drove them to the plane. But I had, I had no clue. My response was, what did I move? Did you see me on video moving you know, something? But I guess he had gotten a, uh, a, a call from the corporate attorney at Trump Organization and said, save this video, video footage. And that's when he went to look at the footage and said, why didn't you tell me Carlos? Is, you know, I guess it's Carlos was moving boxes. And this is really important, this moment about the surveillance footage, because Carlos has now been, he was indicted in part for lying to federal investigators because he was having a conversation with another one of your coworkers about deleting that Correct. footage that Trump had told him to have the server deleted. Did you and Carlos ever have any other conversations about the surveillance footage? So sometime in August, after the, um, it, it, when, I, when I met with the uh, prosecutors, I said after the raid, and they immediately corrected me and said search. lawfully executed search warrant. So after the lawfully executed search warrant, I was on a cruise the day that Mar-a-Lago they showed up at Mar-a-Lago. I was going to a cruise and I had gotten a phone call. But when I got back, like a couple days from when I got back, I, re I reached out to a friend of mine who worked at another Trump property. And he said, 
hey, by the way, your boy's in trouble. I hear your boy's in trouble. I'm like, what do you mean? And he's talking about Carlos. And I'm like, Carlos didn't do anything wrong. He's like, well, that's not what I hear. I heard he asked you, Seal, to delete video footage. And I said, he would never do that. I mean, you Seal's making that up. Something's not right. So, you know, now I'm like, something isn't jiving here. And you Seal Tavares is, he was the IT employee at Mar-a-Lago that in the indictment it says Carlos had the conversation with about deleting the server, right? Correct. But that's the first I had ever heard of that is when a friend tells me that my friend's in trouble, basically. But when you started to think about the conversation you and Carlos had about surveillance footage, and then you have this conversation, are you beginning to get yeah. suspicious? It's all like a puzzle, and it's little pieces here and there, and now I'm wondering. And, you know, I asked Carlos, I said, did you say that to him? No, no, I didn't. I wouldn't. I, I asked him about the video footage time for timing and how long until it deletes. He denied to you that he had tried to That's correct. get it deleted. That is correct. But you got a call from Walt Nada after the search happened. Correct. What did he say to you? So I was on my way to my birthday weekend down at the Hard Rock, and uh, I think I texted him like, hey, I'm, you know, we'll talk at like in an hour I was with people or something. So I called him back, and he's like, hey, someone just wants to make sure Carlos is good. I take that as, you know, Trump wants to make sure Carlos is. So, you know, I, I reply, listen, Carlos is very loyal. He would not do anything to affect his relationship with the boss. I've never seen him, you know, he's never been happier on the job. I mean, he had a very close relationship with the former president. It was, everybody saw it at the club. I mean, they would always interact. They would walk around the property. They would, I mean... Um, so, you know, I told him, no, there's, there's, Carlos would not do anything to affect his relationship with the boss. Why do you think you had to assure Trump's body man? I, I, I really don't know. I, I, I'm sure somebody, I, you know, I, I think the former president told Walt to reach out to me. I, I, I don't know why. And then did you later have to assure to anyone else that, that your friend Carlos would be loyal to so, Trump? The end of that call with Walt, he told me, he's like, we're going to get Carlos an attorney. It's like, okay. So I get to the Hard Rock or right around the same time frame, and Walt says, they add me to a, a signal chat group with Susie Wiles, and he says, it was something to the effect like, Brian, just can you put in this chat what you just told me? So I type it up. I say, hey, you know, it's a little weird to me, but... Um, Listen, Carlos is very loyal. He would not do anything to affect his relationship with the boss. He loves what he does, you know, and you don't have to worry about Carlos <laughs> to, to, that, to that, you know, effect. And for those who don't know, Susie Wiles is running Trump's 2024 campaign, and Signal is an encrypted app where your messages disappear. Correct. So Walt Nauta told you that they were going to get Carlos an attorney. What Correct. happened after that? Did he get a call? So... From I'd say within 30 minutes, I think it was probably a lot sooner. I'm with Carlos. We're at the Hard Rock by the food court, and his phone rings, and it's the former president. You know, he takes the call. We're, we're standing in the food court. I think we went to sit down, and he, I, I can't remember how long the conversation was, but I know at the end of the conversation when they hung up, Carlos said, he's going to get me an attorney. Did he tell you anything else that Trump said to him? I didn't ask, and I, I don't remember him saying anything else, but... I was just told not that long, not, you know, too long before, we're getting him an attorney by Walt, and then he gets the call that he's going to get him the attorney. Who's paying for your attorney? I, I actually had um, reached out to counsel before anybody came to talk to me, just so I was prepared. Um, I knew it was coming. I just had a feeling. Um, but, no, I paid for my own attorney. Why was that important to you? Something like this, I think it's better to look after yourself and take care of it yourself. Um, you know, even the voicemail by the attorney that called me, you know, he says, I'm representing former President Trump. Hey, Brian, good morning. My name is John Rowley. I'm one of the lawyers representing President Trump. It's my understanding that you got a grand jury subpoena. Would you please give me a call at your first opportunity? Did you ever call that attorney back? No. I sent it to my attorney and let him handle it. Were you feeling pressured to stay in Trump's world? Carlos and I were very close, you know, as, 
as was previously reported, you know, he, there was a golf tournament. Carlos, oh, you, you, let me get you tickets. Let me, or uh, I'm sure the boss would love to see you. You know, in my mind, you know, I would not step foot in any of his properties uh, again. <laughs> You know, the attorney, I think there was a lot of pressure there, I feel. Um, it got brought up multiple times. You know, he mentioned to me, why didn't, why didn't you call him back? It's going to cost you a lot of money. I mean, you should see my attorney bills that I get. It's thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. I said, I I'm okay. I'm good. So not only did you feel pressured to get an attorney, you were also being offered tickets and, and FaceTime with the former president. That's what he said. He said he'd love to see you. Well... Did Carlos ever imply to you, given your close friendship, I mean, the fact that you're neighbors, you knew his wife, you guys had had decades of friendship, did he ever imply to you that he might be in trouble? He said everything will be fine, that kind of attitude. I, I never, maybe a couple times I saw him maybe a little nervous, but overall, I, I think he feels like this is going to go away. Did the two of you ever talk about moving boxes or looking back on that? Yeah, I mean, there was one time towards one of the last times I was with them and we're talking about, you know, boxes and, you know, well, Biden did the same thing. It, you know, you can't get, it always got brought up about Biden and other people that did the same thing. And then there was one time he said, uh, you know, we're all dirty, we all move boxes. And I said, well, look, I, I didn't even know what I was moving until I was at the plane, and that's when I remember moving boxes. You know the property really well. And one thing that we read about in the indictment that the prosecutor said was that essentially there were thousands of guests that had come through Mar-a-Lago in the period that the documents were there. Correct. We know they were kept in all kinds of public places. I mean, how secure would you say Mar-a-Lago is? Well, I mean, there's been some very public instances of people sneaking on property. Um, look, I think it's secure, but there were definitely a lot of gaps where people could get in very easily. Did Who had access to the rooms where the documents were kept? I, I, you know, I don't know if it, a master key, but I mean, like, I could have went and got a master key to all the rooms, you know, for check-ins. You know, I oversaw all the check-ins with the valets, all of that. So, I mean, feasibly at night, anybody could. Who made the call where these boxes were kept? You know, the pine I hall have. in the, in the well, ballroom? Well, pine, pine hall was always guarded. You didn't have to worry about any security breaches for pine hall. But, you know, definitely the lake room, which is pretty much above, close to almost above pine hall. I mean, anybody could just go around a spiral staircase, turn left, and there it is. Anybody could access that room? Well, I'm sure you needed a key, but yeah, I mean, there were multiple ways to get to the lake room. How many people had a key, if you had to guess? I'm assuming they didn't change, the, if they had the same lock, oh my gosh, they're probably over 10 keys, 20 keys. I don't, I mean, all the managers had master keys. Do you view Trump as a national security risk? Um, I, I personally would just say I just don't believe that he should be a presidential candidate at this time. I think it's time to move on. Does it concern you that, I mean, he very I think well it should be. concern, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we can do better. You're obviously a central witness in this case. If it goes to trial, are you prepared to testify? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. His attorneys are trying to get it pushed, though, past the election. Do you believe that this trial should happen before the election? I mean, I think the American people have the right to know the facts that this is not a witch hunt. I mean, he can go out on TV and say this. That's one of the reasons for doing this. Um, and quote, you know, the PRA says this and that. I, it's all bogus. But people believe him. Um, you think it's a fair investigation? Absolutely. I mean, to me, you have the law and order president attacking agents, the special counsel, on an almost a daily basis when these people are just taking their sworn, sworn oath. They, they took a sworn oath to um, basically follow the laws of this country. And now you have somebody attacking them. I, I don't think that's right. It must feel like you're choosing between you know, loyalty to, these, to your Absolutely. friends and telling the truth. Uh, absolutely. And there, there's no person that wants loyalty more than the former president. I mean, he says it all the time. Given how other people who have been in Trump's orbit 
and left and told the truth and how they've been treated, did it ever make you hesitate to? No, I, I, look, I was always going to tell the truth. But, you know, after one of the interviews with uh, the justice, uh, the investigators on this case, you know, um, I think it got real when at the end of, it was either my second or third, fourth time talking to them, where they said at the end of it, oh, by the way, all of your grand jury testimony and witness testimony has been turned over to the Trump defense. You know, at that point, you're like, oh boy, you know. Did it make you nervous? Yeah, a little bit, but you know, I, I don't want to live in fear. I mean, we're only here for a finite time. Um, to me, I, I refuse to live in fear like that. I mean, yes, cautious, but uh, you know, I'm going to tell the truth. And those investigators had actually encouraged you to not talk to Carlos. They, they did. Did they, were, what were they worried about, do you think? Um, you know, I remember uh, one time one of the uh, um, uh, members of the special counsel's team said, you know, they worry about maybe he records you or maybe he's going to use stuff against you. It was a tough time. I mean, I remember, you know, we were so close. So I remember, you know, he sent me a text one day after I had kind of avoided him. And it's like, you know, you never called me back. Uh, what did I do to you? Or something like that. And, you know, it really, it really hurt. I mean, I literally said, are you home? And I went to his house. And I said, look. I've been told, really, we need to keep our distance. And I think his response is, yeah, I know. I know you've changed and this and that. But, you know, I'm torn. <laughs> I'm trying to do what they say. But I'm also trying to be a friend to my best friend. And I'm not trying to hurt him by giving testimony or anything. I mean, I mean this is the thing I see. This guy has, the former president has divided the nation like I've never seen before. And he's now divided like my best friend since I was 19 years old, almost. You know, we, we, we've been friends for so long. And just think, now you're just, it's, it, I don't know. It's just very, it sucks. <laughs> well, and the two of you are so close. And to go from having that and to having it, you know, now where you are, where you can't speak, it makes me remember this, you know, something that Trump's Attorney General Bill Barr once said to me, which was that, Trump kind of leaves this, this path of carnage in his wake of the people around him that become wrapped up in these investigations and scandals. And is that what you feel like? Well, I felt here? like it was a total no win situation for me. I mean, they're asking me questions about my, one of my best friends. I'm being honest, but I also have a bad feeling that what I'm saying is getting him into trouble. It's, it's just not, nobody should have to go through that. And, you know, for him to get out up there all the time and say the things he says about, you know, about this being a witch hunt and everything, it's, it's all, you know, I, it's just, he just can't take responsibility for anything. It's really notable to hear this coming from you because you are someone who was loyal to him. You worked for him for forever. You yeah. know him really well. And so I just wonder, you know, you know that once this is public, He'll try to distance himself from you or downplay your role. How will you respond to that? No, I, look, I, I expect nothing less. It, it's fine. I know the truth. I, you know, look, I'm not saying him and I were best friends and talked every day, but he knew who I was. I knew who he was. How do you view Trump as a person now? Unfavorably would be, would be the, to put it easy, mildly. How important is it for you here to tell the truth? No, I mean, that's all we can do. Um, I haven't tried to skirt anything with investigators or anything. Um, I just, I feel it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing for the country. I mean, this is so much bigger than me. It's bigger than Carlos. You know, this is a nation that needs to decide who's going to be the, the next president. Were there ever any instances when you were still working there that you witnessed where Trump was, in your view, carelessly throwing around national security information? You know, this really, you know, stood out to me, but in, uh, I believe it was April of 2021, um, there was a member, Anthony Pratt, who he was coming, he, he 
flew in the night before. He's an Australian billionaire. He finishes his meeting with the former president, gets in the car, and his chief of staff says, how did the meeting go? Pratt, without saying, just says, he told me, and it would be, you know, U.S. military, you know, classified information of what he told him about Russian submarines and U.S. submarines. And that's really all I remember hearing, and I went, what? You know, I'm thinking this. I'm in the car. I'm like, did I just hear that? So it, it wasn't like, oh, the meeting went well. We talked about it. it. was He went straight to the point. He told me that the U.S. subs and with the Russian subs and, you know, something that would pro more than likely, in my mind, be classified. So it was clear to you that he was basically seeking access to China. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, red flags went up in my mind years before that. So Anthony Pratt, this Australian billionaire that you're talking about, he would pay a lot of money to, to come and have these New Year's Eve parties so, in Mar-a-Lago. So it might cost $1,000, $1,500 per person. He was giving a million dollars. And I think at the height, he had 30 or 40 people there. So something that would be 50,000, let's just say max 50. Here's a guy that's just buying access. It's, it's very easy to see.